Hold on. Can you see my whole screen? Yes. You can see my whole screen or just John? We can see John. Great. Everybody turn up your volume. And we have to be really quiet, Kathy, because we'll interfere with this. You ready? You recording? Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. And welcome to Feedback Friday, everyone. We have a theme song. You're supposed to be dancing. We may not be able to see you, but the video will be able to see you. And we're finally getting it together. Uh, today's episode 20 of Woo! our Feedback Friday series, and it's our weekly show where we speak to scholars, artists, um, scientists, dyers, everybody that we can figure out who's interested in natural dyes, textiles, and color. Um, so as you all know, I'm Kathy Hattori, uh, president of Botanical Colors, and joining me is Amy Dufo, our director of sustainability and social media. Um, Amy's the brains behind the operation. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> and uh, so we provide natural dyes online to artisans and industry. We also have a commercial, um, a custom dye house in Seattle. So before we start, I just want to say thank you, everyone. We have made it through 20 weeks with your help, your support, your good energy, the love letters, everything. It's just kind of kept us going. Thank you so much. It's been amazing. And uh, we could not have done it without you. So thanks so much. Um, and you guys have helped support some of the people that we've asked you to help um, with and some of their projects. So Kabibi Ajanku, as you knew, know, who gave a presentation a few weeks back, she was able to hold the children's camp, thanks to all the generous support from um, all of you guys. So thank you very, very much. Um, our presenter today, who you've already met because he was like busy setting up his um, background, is John Marshall. And any of you who are um, West Coasters or interested in Japanese textiles have come across John's work in the last many, many years. I've known him since for a long time, John. <laughs> <laughs> Best not to think too hard. That's right. Let's not think too hard about that. We, we, John's been a friend of Botanical Colors for a long time and um, just been an amazing artist. So he specializes in natural dyes and traditional Japanese techniques, which includes uh, katazome, which is stencil dyeing with um, a rice paste resist, and susugaki, which is uh, doing a rice paste resist, but instead of doing it through a stencil, you have a cone, kind of like a cake decorating cone, but um, this is not cake decorating. This is much more beautiful. John's internationally um, noted for his use of color and line, and he creates truly unique, one-of-a-kind art to wear. Um, he draws his inspiration from traditionally uh, traditional aesthetics, but he makes contemporary treasures for daily life. Uh, as a teacher, John's recognized for his ability to adapt uh, pretty complex techniques to um, a, a non-Japanese audience and really tailor it to skill levels, temperaments, climate, water, you name it, he can do it. So um, it's kind of like John has, has mastered the turn on a dime and he's really good at it. It's gonna be a great presentation. John also has a series of online uh, videos, training videos that will send you all the information on how to access those when we send around the video link. Um, the next thing is that um, for housekeeping, Amy's our moderator and she'll be monitoring the chat on this call, which will be uh, opening up after the presentation. 
That's where you can post your questions. Some of you have sent in questions already and we have those queued up and ready to ask John after the presentation. Um, everybody, if you could make sure you're muted during the presentation and then once um, we're done, we'll open it up for uh, hellos and goodbyes at the very end of the, the show. Uh, our call, as always, is being recorded. Let me just make sure. Yes, it says recording. Uh, it's being recorded <laughs> and we'll have a video copy ready this weekend um, along with all the resource and question uh, information that you've been asking. So two more things. Um, we've got two classes that are upcoming. One is the final workshop for Abu Bakr Fofana in stitching and construction, and that's August 29th through September 2nd. We're working with traditional, traditional Malian strip cloth for this class. So if you have any type of interest, please join us. And secondly, uh, Porfirio Gutierrez, who joined us a few weeks back to speak about the Zapotec way of weaving and natural dyeing is going to be um, uh, conducting a class, a two-day cochineal class uh, through the assistance of Cattywampus crafts in Ojai, California. So he'll be Zooming from there. It's a Zoom class. We'll send you the materials. And um, that is September 18th and 19th. So we hope you can join us for those. So without any further ado, I'd like to present you to John Marshall. John, welcome. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Kathy. Um, let's see. I'm seeing Sally Ishikawa. Is that what I'm supposed to see on my screen? Uh, let's see, Sally, if you there could mute, that would be great. There we go. And so now I'm seeing you, Kathy, that's great. Oop, now I'm not hearing you. John, if you want to be yes. able to see everybody in the upper right-hand corner is like a little uh -huh. grid, and yeah, that'll give you it. the Hollywood squares of everybody. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that would scare me at this point, okay. so I'll go without for the moment. <laughs> so uh, tell me this, since this is my first time doing this, you can see me and everything's fine to go. Got it. Okay, then I'll proceed. So thank you again, for everybody, for being here. Um, my glasses are such that I can't see the screen if I do that, but I can't see other things if I do. So I'll be flipping back and forth with that. And I've watched a lot of the Feedback Friday programs and they're really wonderful. And I was trying to think what way I would fit in best with that in terms of doing a presentation. So Kathy, Amy and I went over a couple things. And what I've presented for you is um, more like a, a video type thing rather than a PowerPoint. And so we'll see how that works today. Um, a lot of it I'm discussing basically people who have influenced my life and the kind of things I'm working towards. It's going to go along a little bit fast clip, but certainly there'll be time for questions and things later, right, Kathy? So um, I should go ahead at this point and hit um, share screen. And I will go with that. Whoops, wait a minute. I want to, sorry, just I want to back up to the beginning. All right, now I'm going to share screen and we'll push go. And so you're seeing that okay, right? The image? Yes. Yes. You are seeing it. Okay, good. So basically, I live in a tiny town called Covalo. Let me back up just a second since I delayed myself there. I live in a tiny town called Covalo. It's centered in Round Valley, which is obviously a Round Valley. It's a beautiful place in Northern California. The blue circle was showing where my studio is. And this is an aerial shot of that studio. And then here's a little bit of a side view of it. So I live in an old flour mill in the middle of town. It's the town uh, square, basically. It was built in the 1880s. Um, and then I bought it in 1998 in this condition and have been fixing it up. I was a fixer upper, obviously. So I repainted it. My dad made some new numbers for the top with current dates and so forth. And basically I've had the luxury of installing all the equipment, everything I want to do the kind of work I love doing, the natural dyeing. This is what the inside looked like when I first arrived. The circle indicates where this bathroom is now, <laughs> okay? Just to give you an idea of the change of the interior. And this is what the inside of the bathroom looks like. So it's been fun building all of these things. Um, each one is an art project in itself. And I have to admit, I enjoy the construction as much as I enjoy the textile work. This is the inside of the studio. 
And uh, we do get snow, it's Northern California, so this is dead of winter. But this fall and the spring are also quite beautiful. You can see here all the flowers, it's very lush here. The soil's incredible for growing all sorts of plants, including dye plants, of course. And this is a view out of the studio onto the deck in the fall, and then a view of the same thing in the spring coming up. Okay, so it gives you an idea of what our seasons are like here. The backyard I pretty much fill with the polygonum uh, indigo. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful plant. It grows easily here. It has in my area, uh, my internet, okay, are, everything grows well in Covalo. I grew up in a tiny town called Florin near Sacramento. And my godmother is uh, Mary Tsukamoto. She also happened to be my fifth grade elementary school teacher. During that time, she began teaching us Japanese and an int a love for Japanese textiles, dolls, all of that. And this is uh, Mrs. Tsukamoto later in her life. She's won all sorts of teaching, international teaching awards and so forth. So at 17, I wound up going to Japan and I was able to meet Kunio Ekiguchi, who's known for his paper craft work in the United States. He introduced me to newspapers. This is from Asahi newspaper doing an article on me about doll making. And then he also introduced me to my dai teacher, uh, Matsuyo Hayashi. She was kind of a sad person, but she overcame a lot of hardship and prejudice to teach me, which I very much appreciate. This is a photo I took of her, and I think it sort of captures her loneliness in a way. Uh, but thanks to both of them, I was able to, again, have contact with different companies published through Kodansha. These are friends helping me set up a show in Shoulen in Tokyo, which was sponsored by Kodansha International. Um, they re guild leafed all the interior just a month before my show. This is Mrs. Kanematsu, the woman I stayed with, the family I stayed with, and she taught me the Japanese sewing. I do a lot of shows in Japan. This again is at Shouen through the sponsorship of Kodansha. The State Department has sponsored shows. This is in uh, Thailand. This is in Fukuoka. Uh, this show was sponsored by the Mafia of Western Japan. They are good supporters of mine. Uh, these are some of the fashion models for that. To give you an idea of kind of the work and involvement I've had in Japan. Um, and this is the type of work I love doing. I'm after a Japanese aesthetic using Japanese techniques, but something you can still drive in. This is some of my early work done entirely with soot on silk. Uh, this is uh, cochineal pigment, barberry and indigo. This is mostly cochineal, a little bit of matter. I always use local models. Um, this is Daphne Muse. She's a, a teacher at Mills College, a professor. And Helen just happened to walk into my studio one day and try this on, so I took the opportunity to photograph her. This is a piece I did for uh, Eki Gucci. He's the year of the horse, and so I did a Noren for him. And so going on with the Noren and the indigo, um, this is a piece that I created for the Morikami Museum in Florida. And what I chose as the theme is indigo. And you can see the circles are, indigo, are indicating each craftsperson is doing a different form of indigo, whether it's the stretched or the yarn or whatever. And then going into my backyard, I pick out the leaves. If somebody asks me a question, I just try to show them how to do it. You know, it's a fun excuse. Um, actually, Deb's been good about that. <laughs> And so I'll mention that a little bit more. But you can print with the fresh leaf indigo. You can rub through stencils. You can pound it. In this case, I have the fresh leaf indigo on silk. And this gives you the results. So you can see it's actually quite complicated imagery that's uh, possible with this. Um, Jay Rich came to my studio once asking me about clamp um, and to help him translate. So I, I did. And as a result in his nudge, I started doing the clamp resist. It's actually a lot of fun. And I'll show you a little clip here of how this is done. So many people, either through their questions, their encouragement, or a passing comment, um, have steered me in different directions. So here's the piece unclamped. And you can see several layers are done at a time. And as I pull away the layers of cotton, you can actually watch the indigo oxidizing. Okay, so layer after layer after layer is removed. And so see, it's green right now. And as you watch, it turns blue. The oxidation process occurs. 
They're different shades of blue because I'm using a Japanese process called kyokechi, which involves um, placing corks in holes to drink the flow of color. This is a piece dyed entirely with indigo, and this is the clamp I carved to do that dyeing. So these are fairly large clamps, you can see. They're mirror image. The cloth gets pinched between the different blocks, and those holes are what allow the dyes to flow in and out. And by corking them, I can control what colors go in. So here you see the hole. That means that color is flowing in, and the corked ones, the color is restricted. In this case, I'm dipping it into an indigo vat, but in the same piece, I also boiled it in onion skins. And while it was still hot, I took some of Botanical Colors um, dye extracts, the liquids, and squirted them into it. And because it was hot, it stained them. And that allowed me to achieve these different colors. And so you'll see here, I've pulled it out now from the onion skin. And as I open it up, you can see that there are a range of colors on this. Kathy, this is that Kaya fabric you sent me a while back. <laughs> okay, you sent me some mosquito beautiful. net fabric. Okay, so again, back to the indigo. Um, I also do primarily stencil dyeing. That's my first love. So this is a stencil I carved of old friends visiting. Combining that with other stencils, I have my rice paste on the cotton. Now, I can dip it in indigo and get a beautiful solid color. No problem with that. The paste itself ca can cause a little distortion. But if I go in and deliberately paint very dark indigo, same indigo pigment, very dark indigo in certain select spots, then when I dip it in the indigo, the background will have maybe only one layer. But where I've put the dark part, I now have several layers. So you can see here the difference in the effect you have a lot more uh, movement in the piece. And you can go ahead and play with the paste some more and get all kinds of different layers. Um, now, Cheryl uh, Lawrence is a fr longtime friend of mine. She was teaching a class up at Maiwa recently and asked me to do a series of pigment tests for her. So you see the stencil on the left. The second one in line is the rice paste on the silk. The next one, and you can see the colors noted in the bottom edge. The next one is strictly rust with a little bit of indigo. The next one is different shades of ochre and indigo. The next one is a green pigment. And again, Botanical Colors carries these pigments. Um, they're all mixed with soy milk as a binder. All pigments, everything here is pigment. Indigo is also a pigment, remember, okay? Um, most of these are mineral pigments. So each one is only one variation in the type of color being used. But look what a huge range of effects you can achieve. So in these last three coming up, the one on the left now was done in a straightforward manner. The paste was washed away. The middle one then has rinses of color to create uh, an interesting effect. And the last one has additional paste put on to protect what had been dyed so that now I could dye the currently exposed background. So all of these are the same materials. They're all the same dyes. It's just approaching the process from a slightly different perspective. The nice thing about the minerals and the pigments, the vegetable pigments, is that you can have very delicate pastel shades. You can have deep, rich colors. But no matter what color you use, it's always very high quality, um, very rich and saturated. Now, Deb's been to the studio <laughs> a number of times. I'm glad I found that good image of you, Deb. Um, and what she has often is she'll go plowing through the library, and she always comes up with some kind of question I can't answer. And she says, well, what does this say? Translate this. Okay, so um, a while back, I decided, well, as long as I was translating it for her and the other students, I may as well go ahead and do it for real, okay? So I have a huge collection of limited edition books. I have, uh, as an example, some of my natural dye authors. I have three generations, the grandfather, the father, and the son, all who are natural dyers. I collect all of their books. So I go through these and use these as the reference in my own work. I love collecting the antique books. They have wonderful samples, incredible ways of presenting the colors. So I use that as a starting point. I try to make books that I would want to buy. So this is a limited edition. It, it happens to be sold out now, but um, it was the first one I did using strictly fresh leaf indigo. The pen's there for scale. It had a recipe on the side with a sample pasted in on the right. You saw the sample a little bit earlier on cotton. 
And what I loved about the old Japanese books is the pages were interestingly shaped. They had these samples. Um, when we were kids, we used to get the Japanese comic books for summer school that used to have inserts. They were like glorified Cracker Jacks. They had uh, math puzzles and, and assembly things and stuff. And I've always found that fascinating. So I try to include that in my work. Um, this shows you the process of one piece. I use fresh leaf indigo only with this. It's stamped clamped, dipped, and stitched. All of those can be combined. And at the end of this book is a limited edition. I had a coupon to get seeds and then the numbering and so forth. So presentation is important to me. Part of the natural uh, fresh leaf indigo dyeing is its beauty and simplicity and just plain clean feel. So here's the tea that I make from just leaves and water, standard traditional Japanese. I've put the rice paste in it with those accents I mentioned earlier and have simply dipped it in the water carefully so that the paste doesn't wash away. But gradually that peacock blue, that exquisite clean color of the fresh leaf dyes the silk. And then of course it's what the paste resist is washed out. And so um, singing the blues was the result, the next step. I wanted something that wasn't a limited edition that people would have wider access to. And so in this book, I did tests for all the different shades that could be done. I tried to figure out techniques for other people like it doesn't have to be katazoma stencil. How about if we go for a wax batik look? Can you do that with the paste? All of these are things I wanted to experiment with. Um, the samples that I prepared were showing all the different shades of fresh leaf indigo colors that you can get simply by varying the fiber or varying the pH of the fresh leaf. Slight pH changes dramatically changes the color. All those kimono shapes you just saw are straight from my garden. And then it's also fun trying to figure out what will actually work. That was a little bit too elaborate an example, um, but I'll get beautiful, rich, fresh leaf colors. Um, in this case, a friend of mine sent me some silk. So as a thank you, this shows the shoulder, so, uh, shoulder stitched. Um, as a thank you, I dyed this blouse for Mrs. Kanematsu and her friend Mrs. Sua in Tokyo. Mrs. Sua sent the silk, so I wanted to send her something back as a thank you, and it was the blouse. Um, now going on to collecting again, I wanted to have a different way of presenting the indigo to people or other natural dyed things. So here I've dyed ribbons in all these different shades. I've collected Japanese pieces of hand-painted indigo, of stenciled indigo, and in this case I try to include samples of the stencil used to dye the piece as well, so you um, can relate to the process. This is mud dyeing and indigo. A lot of people, as beautiful as indigo is, only think of indigo. It's exquisite when combined with other colors as another element in your palette of design. Here this um, tie-dye was done with blue flower, and this box I love, it says just one little bump 10,000 times to do that bolt. And this is printing with natural indigo, uh, cochineal, and barberry. Also part of collecting for me is knowing how to read the labels. So part of that book includes a back section that tells you all the different ways to read indigo to know whether you're getting a real indigo piece or a synthetic indigo. Then all of those were put together in a larger collection. Um, each textile, there are about 50 samples, each textile having its own card. And each of those cards relate to the information in the book itself. I try to present these, again, presentation is important to me. I try to present these so that you can actually look at the back. That's important to dyers and weavers. So this is how the book comes. Um, and again, I'm focusing on Japanese approach to things. The box is made by Anthony Kleisis, who is a loom maker in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So his name is in it as well as my stamp. And let's see. So once you open it up, part of the fun again is unpackaging things. Again, Japanese binding. So I've, we pull it open so that it's easy to access the cards themselves. And then you can see that there is this book that includes the information for every sample. So if it's tie-dye, it tells how tie-dye is done. If it's indigo, it tells exactly what kind of indigo it was, what region it came from. And then this is the Singing the Blues book you saw earlier, which actually tells how the indigo colors are produced.
I love some Indian cookbooks that have the little spice containers in them. And so I tried to mimic that in the little uh, car, um, containers you see there. And of course, since it's limited edition, it has the signed number and so forth that goes along with it. And that goes back in there. And then we'll take a look at the samples. So this contains seeds, it contains blossoms, leaves, and the different types of processed indigo. You saw earlier the different colors that I've dyed uh, with the cotton ribbons. This diver is one done with the leaves from my garden. These others are, are Japanese traditional pieces. Um, many of them are from living national treasures. Several of them are intangible cultural treasures. All of them are real indigo. And again, the main thing is for us as artists, as weavers, as dyers, to appreciate the incredible range of techniques that the Japanese have employed in using indigo. So let's just take a look at this for a minute. This is an older worn piece of indigo with iron rust added to give a little bit more life to it. And we see that that was sample 22. So if you go to the book and find sample 22, You'll see there's the text that describes the process and at the very bottom there's a chart showing exactly how the pigment sits on the fiber to give the effect that you're seeing. So basically that's it here. Um, you can see a whole range of new textiles, old textiles. Some of the textiles are 200 years old. Uh, they're from Edo period, uh, that one you just saw there was. They're ecots, paste resist, wax resist, uh, woven yarn techniques, all of that. Everything I wanted in a collection, I managed to put together. Okay, and then you can see I also gave some thought as to how to lift these things out carefully. It's like the construction I mentioned earlier, and it's like my dye projects. They all require thinking and planning towards an ultimate goal. And so for me, it's the brain work that's the interesting part, the part that, that gives me satisfaction. And this is a smaller set of the same thing for a smaller budget. And then you'll see here it opens up this way. So it has the same book. It has six or eight samples in it that are carefully selected, mud dyeing and so forth. And then the card itself tells exactly um, what's inside. This is mud dyeing, ecot, uh, stripe weaving, uh, natural dye from the garden, and bingata style. Okay. My main point in showing you all of this is to emphasize the incredible range that indigo offers. Um, it can be used as a pigment, it can be used as a leaf, it can be used as, uh, as paint, as dye, as vat, applied dry. All plants more or less will do this. You just have to have the imagination to explore what they have to offer us. Um, my interests lie not just in dyeing, but in Japanese textiles in general. So this is a book I made for someone collecting. Um, it has 50 samples of Japanese weaves, dye techniques with a description of each. It's small enough so you can put it in your pocket to take when you're out in the field. It covers everything, uh, all natural dyes. It covers uh, yuzen, marbling, batik. There are bagworm skin samples, which are used in some Japanese uh, textiles, uh, woven paper, all of that. Again, um, all the different samples that I would want to have in checking things out in Japan. And I've hand stitched it. It's done in signatures and it's in a hand tooled leather container, okay? It's important to me to share information as a teacher. And so I'm trying to think of all the different ways that make it palatable. I like things I can hold and touch and smell and are tactile. But I also realize that in this new world, uh, we're having to deal with digital things. And so I'm branching off into that area too. Okay, so the first book I published was this Make Your Own Japanese Clothes. It's been in print since 1988, and I'll have a digital version of it out shortly. Many of you are familiar with this book through Botanical Colors, uh, which is now in digital form on my website. And what I'm working on now, I have lots of other books in the process. I haven't finished this one yet, but this is all precious laminates. So everything in this sample collection is 24 karat gold, platinum, lapis lazuli, um, all of the wonderful 
uh, metallics and minerals that the Japanese use as laminates. Every sample represents a different weave or application technique. And again, they're mounted so you can see the backs of each piece. Um, this brown one coming up is on silk, but it's done using a method that the old armor smiths used to use of lacquering directly onto leather or silk. And so these are more lacquer weave. This one is lacquer and velvet. Um, this one is woven lacquer. Uh, this one is a tapestry weave. And again, just on and on, all different samples, each one with its own description of why it's unique. Um, this is little girl's underwear with a gold leaf on the silk. I'm kind of fancy underwear, but um, this one's interesting in that it is laminated dried flowers that have been shredded and woven. I'll have a detail of that in a moment. The couching, um, just, you know, anything you could imagine and more having to do with the precious laminates. This one is mother of pearl that has been um, like a laminate, very, very thinly cut and applied to and woven. It is woven. And then finally, this one also shows you the back that you can see as a weaver. And then finally, what I have coming up here, I believe, is um, an exquisite example of 24 karat gold. I'm sorry. This one is uh, real lacquer on platinum. And this one is 24 karat gold woven loop velvet with supplemental silk uh, weft. And the way the silk, the gold is woven is it's laminated to handmade paper. And so it's one of the samples I want you to see those threads, the paper. And then of course you wanna see the paper itself before it's shredded. So this gold leafing is done on the type of paper used for Japanese currency. So it's very strong, shredded, woven, looped, stitched, it just, you know, technique upon technique. And this very last one is platinum dust over the natural dyes to give that misty look. And here again, the box was made by Anthony, okay? That'll be out next year sometime, I guess. Um, so this is a detail of that plant. I actually have an obi that is made of a dried, shredded, woven eggplant, <laughs> okay? I'm not saying you wanna do that yourself. It's actually quite ugly, but I bought it because I thought, uh, I'd never have the opportunity to come across one like that again. So here's the back of that woven velvet piece that you saw. And this is the front of it. Remember, it's loop velvet, not cut velvet in this case. Now, going back to this piece we saw earlier, these are all pigments, indigo pigment included. And so the kind of pigments I like to use, cinnabar is one, and you can see the orange from that. Um, another very common one is malachite for greens. Um, the black up there, which I don't have shown, is soot. Azurite gives the beautiful cobalt blue. These are simply ground and used with soy milk as the binder. Again, indigo is a pigment in this form, and that's treated exactly as the malachite or cinnabar treated. Cochineal is also a pigment in this case. Uh, many of these dyes are both. Cochineal can be a juice dye with a mordant, or it can be a pigment with soy milk. Soy milk is not a mordant, it's a binder. But you see this incredible range of movement and bright color in this Okinawan style that is achieved with the pigments. Then going back to my doll making for just a moment, this is a doll I made uh, about 30 years ago, envisioning how I might look today doing my katazome. And working with the pigments here, again, I'm creating new pieces all the time. This one is based on a Japanese fairy tale called Urashima Taro. Again, notice how clean and rich and saturated the colors are. And soft, the delicate shadings in the face and so forth. I'll also choose other themes. This one is Our Lady of Perpetual Indifference, um, showing her textiles. I like to work with children. Uh, this is Christopher. He now has children of his own who are in school. And this is the piece he created when he was 12. It just looks so much like a 12 year old's piece of artwork, I love it. He carved the stencil and everything himself. I do fundraisers for groups. Uh, my godmother I mentioned earlier helped to start a group called John Kempo Gakko, which is that scissor paper sword. And so that was an image I did for them. This particular piece is of strangers burying their souls on a park bench. 
A uh, student one time asked me to do a picture of fish. So the tree trunk says fish, 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 and everything in the tree is done with fish. And then I also do a little bit more elegant things for uh, special clients. So again, with the doll making, this is a piece I did for Convergence when it was down in Laguna Beach. Uh, the theme was Tide. And so I created this doll. You can see the hair ornament is of a Slurpee cup with a Chinese crystal. Um, the hair was done with that foam that you use to insulate things. I dyed a kimono for her, which is of waves and clock parts. So as a close up, you can see the gears and things in a stopwatch as part of her kimono pattern. Again, all natural dyes. And for the back where the crest would be, I have the character Shio, which means tide. I was going for the theme tide and time, which is called Shiodoki in Japanese. So the secondary kimono is of Urashima Taro again. The, it's a, a folk tale about a young man who goes to the bottom of the ocean and comes back centuries later. So that was appropriate for time and tide. And now, you know, with the coronavirus, um, I can't have students in my studio anymore. So I'm working more towards getting things online. This is what my front page of my website looks like. If you go to that eyeball and click on it, that's the site map. And at the site map, you'll find there are actually a lot of articles that are about indigo, about Japanese culture, um, about techniques, customs, anything. So you're welcome to visit and read as much as you like. Then working with the online classes I'm developing, um, I have videos I'm putting up of how to make the rice paste, which is so important to the techniques that I use. And then also how to make the, the soy milk, of course, um, how to do the stenciling, how to carve your stencil, how to lacquer it. Um, and in this case, you can see I'm scraping off the blue flower, the uh, Ibana indigo flower, from the pot and that's what I'll use to paint those details in later. It gets mixed with soy milk because in this state it's a pigment and pigments get mixed with soy milk. This is another technique. There are some uh, pulleys up in the rafters there and this allowed me to do the cover for that very first limited edition book that you saw. Uh, the sheen she sticks keep the fabric stretched sideways so that they stay flat. And then I pull this whole thing up and as it goes up the top, it oxidizes and it comes back and does a second layer and a third layer as it gets darker. I have an Eastern exposure. So I like to sit in the morning and separate my leaves from the stems. And then these leaves can be used in doing all sorts of rubbing techniques. I've created texture underneath. Um, I'm using actually an old aquarium plant right now. And the silk is laid on top of that. The leaves are rubbed and you get these beautiful patterns. Some of the videos include dyeing with cochineal with indigo overlays. Um, you can use mica. Mica is a pigment to give you beautiful colors. The gold here was done with mica. So ultimately, this one, uh, the characters say, uh, aura ai yori idete ai yori aoshi. And what that means is, um, it's a Confucian saying, and it means that the teacher hopes for the student to surpass him or her. And ultimately, that's what I'm doing. I'm really thrilled when I see people um, take the techniques I can offer them beyond my limitations and create just wonderful things I could have never conceived of. That's actually my greatest satisfaction. Um, so uh, I will be having some things up tomorrow, um, some things that you've seen here. And if you want to check in at noontime, uh, California time, the website will be available. And Amy will be putting that up a little bit later. That covers the uh, commercial part of this <laughs> segment, okay? Um, so that's it. Let's see how I can, so stop share. Okay, so that was sort of a marathon of information. I hope some of you are still awake at this point. And what kind of questions do you have? What kind of comments or, Kathy, do you have, some place you want to nudge me or I just are going uh, to go ahead and open up um, the yeah, chat just, and the just, tsunami will yeah. begin. <laughs> I, <don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, you know, John, I'll just jump into some questions and thank you sure. so much. That was great. Like, yeah, it was amazing. I, well, I, I'd love to talk with you after about all my thoughts that are, that this is not about the Amy show. So, um, yep. Okay. Chat's open. So some of the questions that came in, John, huh? one, um, Somebody was saying they wrote from, they're coming, they're writing from the Basque country near the French border. 
They live uh-huh. in an old house, long time. Someone, um, long time ago, someone planted a persimmon tree in their wow. yard. They read somewhere that they use it in Japan to dye beautiful silks for kimonos, question mark. Is that true? Yes, you can use it for silk. It's more commonly used on cellulose-based fibers, though. Um, not all persimmons are equal. Um, you actually want a more primitive um, persimmon for that. Actually, I'm going to defer to Deb for just a minute. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, you've died with the Texas persimmon, haven't you? Okay, she said yes. You know what? Check out, we'll, we'll put up later Deb McClintock's uh, webpage. She has good um, posts on this and she'll have more experience than I. I'll give that to you a little bit later, Amy. Okay. Um, but I have persimmon growing in my backyard. I wanted, I planted a fuyu, which is the type of persimmon I like. It died, but the roots came back up. And I'm so glad it did because the roots that came up are actually a very primitive form of persimmon. And they have little teeny tiny, um, maybe dime size, nickel size, you know, maybe an, a centimeter and a half wide, teeny tiny persimmons. And so I pick those and they're perfect because they never get sweet. They have all of that astringent tannin in them, which is what you want for your dye. Um, there's also an excellent book um, by uh, Chris, I um, can't remember her last name now, but it's called Kakishibu. And her website, I believe, is kakishibui.com or used to be. And she's probably one of the best uh, persimmon dyers in the U.S. at the moment. Chris okay. Connors, right? That, Connor? Connor? Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Chris Connors. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I hope that answered that. <laughs> well, I, I hope she that probably just here. wanted a yes. But <laughs> um, so I have a number of ground pigments from France. Do you have instructions for how I can use these? A number of ground or brown? Ground with a G. Ground. Okay. Well, you're lucky they're ground already. Yes, you apply them with soy milk. Um, okay. And I would suggest you, um, there is a wonderful, and you'll have to tell me the name, Amy, because I've forgotten, but there's somebody who did a wonderful program on mineral pigments a few weeks ago, right? Yep. Um, so, what was her name again? Silka What's that? Hawkins. Okay. Yep. So you might want to watch that um, uh, Friday piece. You might want to watch that Feedback Friday. It's an excellent program. Um, I have things on my website, how to use the soy milk in combination with pigments. Most of the work I do is with pigments. And so anything you saw in the video a moment ago was done with the kind of things that you have. Okay. Cool. Um, and I loved when we had our pre-call on Tuesday where you were talking about that, like all the things that are around us that we think we need to like buy everything, but if there's, if you just use common sense, there's things all around you that you can use for your dyeing. And so some of the classes, I really like teaching kids classes because they're, uh, they're not surprised at things sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, of course, you know, it's around us. So I do programs where kids bring in an old t-shirt washed and we walk the neighborhood and see what will make a dye. And we just pick up what we have and bring it back to the studio. Um, in San Antonio, we did it with pecan hulls because they happen to be on the ground at the moment. In town here, we have a lot of volcanic ash and weeds that grow along the roadway. Um, almost anything will make a color. You just have to approach it uh, with optimism. <laughs> um. Somebody had written in, how can you make an indigo vat from dried fresh leaf without using thiox? Well, what you would do is uh, you, go, you can use um, fructose with it. There's actually a recipe in my book. So I don't want to give you the proportions right now because I don't want to do it wrong. But I'm sure that, oh, thank you, Kathy. A <laughs> good plug there. Um, that deals with all of the fresh leaf types of things. Um, if you want a class that's dealing largely with fermented vats and um, uh, that type of dyeing, I think probably a Bubakar is going to be, and I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, but um, he's going to have a wonderful series of programs for you. I'm a little bit better at the, even though I use the fermentation vats and the vats, I'm better at the direct raw leaf application. I enjoy it more myself. And raw, dry leaves count as raw leaves in that sense in my book. And Kathy, did you 
I just just oh, a, like a, a Abu Bakar is um, so basically all of his indigo classes are based uh, on the a fructose type mm -hmm. vat because the fermentation is difficult to do in most of North America because of the amount it's too cold here. Um, we uh -huh. can't keep the vats warm enough, or if we do, we have to have a, it's pretty intensive. So we haven't done those yet, but we're going to try to figure out if we can. Yeah, and I'm counting the fructose actually as partially fermentation in my own mind when I say that. So uh, it's not the Japanese fermentation where you're adding the sake and the bran and so forth. And one of the things they do in Japan, because they do die all winter with the fermentation vat, um, they have their pots sunk in the ground and there's like a crawl space between the actual dirt and the floor that you're standing on. And the places that I visited, they had a little tiny hole in between every four vats. And that would be crammed with sawdust. And in the fall, it would be lit and it would smolder all winter long. And that little bit of heat kept everything just fine. It would burn itself out just about the time spring comes around and they're ready for the warm weather. So it was a really practical way of doing it. So there are ways around that. If you want to do it in North America, put an electric blanket around it. You know, that'll do it if you want to go that route. Okay. A little less cool, but yeah. You could <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you got a problem, you figure out a solution. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking if you collect your own pigment, pigments from minerals, do you collect natural California minerals rocks from your local territories? Uh, yes and no. Um, my dyeing is the same as my uh, diet in terms of eating. I'm an opportunist. I eat what's put in front of me, and I use for color what's put in front of me. But I'll ha I have to say the majority of what I use, actually, I do purchase. I use the Japanese pigments. Um, my first and foremost goal, goal is to produce the textiles that I produce. And if I were to stop and weave every piece of yardage, if I collected every dye that I have, I wouldn't have time to do that artwork. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, having said that, though, it's also fun, diet-wise, to bake bread once in a while. You know, it's fun to make things from scratch. And so, yes, if I'm passing by a landslide and there's some beautiful ochre or some uh, red volcanic rock exposed, I'm going to jump the fence and go get it, you know, and stare down the bull in the process. But um, if I need rust and I don't have any, I'm going to use Bengara from India. You know, um, it's just the way it is. I think I'd like to go on a cross-country journey with you sometime and uh, <laughs> all these natural disasters and opportunities. Yeah, they happen. seem to find me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we shouldn't be together. Yeah, maybe not. So this one, I'm going to try to read it fast. Um, so somebody primed several pieces of natural colored linen with freshly made soy milk, but was unexpectedly uh -huh. called away for a family emergency before they could apply the pigment. They were gone three months, just returned home to well-cured fabric. How should I proceed? Do I retreat it with fresh soy milk and then apply a pigment? Um, good question. Um, I'm, I'm hesitating because almost all of us want a simple yes or no answer, okay, for anything, okay? Um, the fact of the matter is the soy milk has many aspects to its personality. What I generally tell people is that when you apply the soy milk, you want to then apply with a brush, paint on top, any pigments or other colors within a two week period. That's when the soy milk is most receptive. But you don't wanna use it for vat dyeing because if you use it for vat dyeing, because it's not cured and permanent, it'll wash off. Okay, you don't wanna wash it before it's cured. It'll come off. It's the oxidation process that happens over time that makes it permanent. So what your uh, guest is talking about is having fabric with now permanent soy milk on it. So I would say, let it sit another three months to make sure it's absolutely permanent. And then uh, what fiber, did she say what fiber it was? Uh, was it silk or, or cellulose? Uh, linen. Okay, thank you, cellulose. So in that case now, you can treat it like a silk. You can resize it if you want to. 
Um, there are there are some dyers in Japan that I spoke to not long ago who treat Raimi yarn like silk when they dye it. So dyes that you normally think of as protein specific dyes, they get protein like colors on Raimi because they soak that fiber in soy milk first and let it cure for a year. Once it cures for a year, it's completely part of the fiber, but protein. And as protein, it acts like a protein in absorbing the dye. So you see, it's way past what I would consider its receptive period, but still doing the job. So I'd say try it. Um, actually, to use a different, different kind of analogy, if you think about silk, silk is water soluble, right? When it comes out of the worm, it's completely water soluble. It has to be, the, the worm is manufacturing it. It's only when it oxidizes that it becomes non-water soluble and we can sew with it and we can wash it. So that's why the Japanese, all cultures, leave the cocoon alone till just before the moth gets ready to emerge because that has given the silk the maximum amount of time to become non-water soluble. If you were to boil the cocoon right after the worm is finished, it would fall apart, it wouldn't be as strong. So if you think about it that way, the silk is fully cured, but it's still very receptive to color. The soy milk can also act that way at times. So I would say go with the linen, yeah. And if she wants to resize it again, there's no harm in that, other than potentially making the fabric a little stiff. Mm -hmm. And be careful when you ask a question, I'll give you a thorough answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. So I hope, I hope I say this right. So I heard the traditional, is it katagami? Is that how you say it? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's okay. fine. I heard the traditional katagami is no longer made. What is used, what is used in place of the traditional katagami paper for stencils? Okay, so technically I think what they're saying is shibugami, okay. Um, katagami has many different meanings, just to get the vocabulary straight. It also means a carved stencil, okay, and that's why I'm distinguishing it. Shibugami is the name of the paper itself, okay, or katagami shi is the technical term for stencil paper. That's your language lesson, <laughs> okay. Um, it is still being made. Uh, it's being made in Ise. Um, I often visit the old fella who's there, and I used to visit his father um, when I was younger, buying it from them then. Um, but it's just not as available. A lot of people use synthetic. So you have synthetic, which has a petroleum-like smell to it. It's a rubbery kind of paper, um, which I carry. And there's also an intermediate type, which is Western style paper, meaning short uh, fiber that has been impregnated with the persimmon tannin, like the traditional, and that's also being made. So there are those three varieties available, and those are also on my website. And you can buy them in Japan, of course, too. Okay. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more question, which I think is a good introduction or kind of segue into um, some of the things we wanted to talk about, kind of with, with things that you're selling. But uh, so somebody's asking, which one of your books would you recommend as a first introduction to the techniques? Uh, lots of different techniques you just shared, but. Maybe I'm just going to sum this up. What's the best book to start out of yours with? Wow. Well, English majors. Whoa. If you were talking about indigo dyeing, then I would say that singing the blues. If you're talking about katazome and you want a book, I would actually recommend somebody else's. <laughs> okay. Barbara Stefan wrote a book with Aisha Nakano called Japanese Stencil Dyeing. It's long out of print, but it's an excellent book. Um, I don't do everything the same way they do, but it's an excellent book in print, okay? My work right now is all online. And so um, that'll be on my webpage and those are set up as, as classes for you. Uh, but again, if you want something in print, I certainly recommend Barbara Stefan's book. She's an excellent writer and very knowledgeable. Okay. Great, we can add that to our resource list. And somebody just the other day said, hey, where is this uh, email that you send out? Um, I'm not getting it or, but we've been putting it, I've been putting it up 
on Saturdays up on our blog and just to not inundate you guys with a million newsletters like we sent one out yesterday. Um, everything's in there. But if you want to go right away to get all the information that we're talking about, kind of the first layer, that's tomorrow. By tomorrow morning, I'll have it up. And then, like, I know Samantha Verone was just on here. I don't know if she's still here. But she's working on the questions from last week that I will put in that blog post, too, from last week. So just keep checking back. They're, like, I guess kind of live documents, <laughs> live blog posts they keep being added to. All right. Are, are we done with questions, Amy? We are. Yeah, there's, there's lots there's of There's like 7,000 more, but um, we'll try to summarize these. And John, if you have the time, maybe you could look through them. Sure. Um, yeah. And yeah, so thank you very, very much, John. That was yeah, amazing. Was Beautiful work. I learned something thank new you. every single time. Mm -hmm. um, like we mentioned, we, we carry John's book singing the blues it's about using indigo um we have we've been doing these indigo classes with abu bakar and many people are asking oh i'm growing my own indigo now what do i do and because abu bakar's tradition is different uh he doesn't often have a whole lot of information but if you're growing persicaria or polygonum indigo this is the book it has everything in it john's been able to uh distill information that he's getting from uh, his own experience as well as uh, texts that we don't have access to so uh, it's well worth it and it's available on his website as well as ours um i was supposed to ask you if you're working on anything new but we're already over <laughs> no problem <laughs> okay we'll do that the next time we have you on the show okay. we'll talk about the future um so thank you again and uh, just to talk a little bit about next week i'm often asked by dyers, what's the matter with my water? But really, our presenters next week are going to be, what's the water with my matter? So it's um, <laughs> Jamie Bourgeois and Madeline McGarity, who have been other uh, natural dyers and um, scientists in training, and they're going to be talking about uh, a matter experiment that they've been doing with all different types of matter, all different types of water, They've been collecting it from, um, from ponds, puddles, who knows where, uh, to see what is the effect of, of water on matter. So the results are super interesting and we can't wait to have them show us what's going on next week. So um, that's, yes. One of the, I, I just got the RSVP up this morning for that. And what I think I thought was really interesting and I invite you all to like, cause I just came across these two on Instagram. If you have something that you're working on, that's looking at environmental issues or social issues in relation to dyes, please email me. But like they're, they're looking at toxic contaminants taken from Louisiana's cancer alley. And there was a great article that's looking at this, you know, the, what's in that water and using natural dyes as the way to really showcase the contamination of that Louisiana, Louisiana's cancer alley, which is a 150 mile stretch of the Mississippi, famous for pollution and cancer rates. So lots of interesting ways we can be thinking about natural dyes telling a different story. That is the wrong kind of fame, isn't it? Yeah, it's but it's interesting. To see. I love that they're both in different places taking, looking at those, looking at water and yeah. This is going to be a fantastic presentation. Yeah. We're, we're very, very interested in this. Um, so without anything else that we're going to be talking about, we just want to have everybody unmute, say hello to John. John, thank you again. It was really wonderful to see the scope. Thank you, John. And thank you. all 244 thank you. people. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye, Kelly. Bye. Bye. Hi, Sherry. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. Hey guys. Oh, did well. Oh, I thought John disappeared. I was like, where did John go? No, I, I don't think so. not intentionally. <laughs> it's become psychedelic, John. Right? Hey, where are yeah. you? Like a gallery view, so that everybody's just like being shifted. There you are. Oh. Here. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Wow. Oh, oh. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Oh, um, hit go up to speaker view. Do you see that upper uh, right hand corner? Yeah, up to speaker but you view. need to keep talking because oh, yeah, I'm gonna keep talking. I'm talking. Yeah. I'm talking. I'm talking. You can <laughs> spotlight me at the gallery. Yeah. yeah, spotlight you. Yeah, I'm gonna spotlight myself. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so look what? at this one. Wow. Yeah. Kate, Kate and I have this like inquiry into Laharia, which is what this tie-dye technique is. Uh -huh. So we're going to try and figure out how to do this. We've wow. got a wow. very, very thin fabric. Beautiful. Yeah, this is super gauzy stuff. Oh, beautiful. This is like a more simple one that might be attainable, right? Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I guess I'm going to stop the recording. Everybody say bye. Oh, yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 bye.